Most two-dimensional design theories address singular images. While the elements of design analyze the context of it, the interior of an image or how its parts relate, fewer texts discuss the relationship between images within a group or portfolio of images. However, most artists work in groups or bodies of related works, not just singular images. Indeed, gallery and museum curators expect some sort of consistency from an artist's work. Working in applied art formats where you're working for a client might be a little different. When you create a series of images, like sentences in a paragraph, the relationship between pictures is vital to revealing their narrative. The context you build between the images often provides the most lasting impression. While placing images together, whether in a space, on a wall, in a book, or on a website, the connection between these images, or lack thereof, inform the viewer as to the totality of their meaning. When arranging pictures, the arrangement itself can lend to the connotations of the work. When considering works that utilize a series of images, it will become apparent that the order these pictures appear in is either important or it isn't. This provides the two basic kinds of series, one that is sequential or serial. Sequences have long been used in art. Here's a dictionary definition of sequence. One, a following of one thing after another, succession. An order of succession, arrangement. A related continuous series, or the act of following. Looking at this definition, a sequence has a transition. It has a definable order. Usually a sequence has a start, a middle, and an end. There's some sort of transition of idea from start to end. Serial imagery, on the other hand, is of, related to, consisting of, or arranged in a series. A sequence is a series, but a series need not necessarily be sequential. I should tell you, in art criticism, these words often are used interchangeably, but you can see from these dictionary definitions, they really do have different meanings. In serial imagery, we see a group of pictures that consist of related parts whose power or resonance build their meaning, but they need not be seen in a specific order. Serial images use multiplicity. They use repetition to help create meaning. Serial images strive on consistencies, while sequential imagery suggests change. Hopefully you'll see that in my examples. Critic A.D. Coleman wrote, in the same way that a frame or division in a picture can imply a relationship that has not existed previously, two or more pictures put together or in a sequence can give a more intense view than a single picture, the whole being more than the sum of its parts. Well, this sequence, if you will, is a series of 12 pictures taken by Edward Mybridge in the 1870s. In a way, this was a sequence that changed the world. It came about by a bet. Leland Stanford, who was then governor of California and owned racehorses, had a bet with a fellow racehorse owner that when a horse ran in full gallop, that it didn't have all four hooves off the ground facing forward and back, what is now known is the flying gallop, how horses were always depicted in artworks prior to the publication of these photographs. Here's an example of the flying gallop, and you can see in this the hooves straight forward and straight back. 
But in my Bridges photograph, what he did is he set up a series of 12 plates, 12 cameras along a track. This was still the early days of photography. And essentially what he did is he painted a grid along the track. You see that in the background. He had a rider on a horse that ran down the track. He had a succession of 12 cameras lined up. As the horse passed an area, it broke a string, which tripped the shutter, which made a picture. And he did this sequence of 12 images. Then you see from start to finish. And what you see is the second frame proves Stanford right. A horse may have all four hooves off the ground when it runs at a full gallop, but not how it had been depicted in art prior to this. In essence, this was a groundbreaking moment, not just in photography, but in art and for media in general. What you're seeing with this image through a series of other kinds of inventions, some of which Mybridge made, some uh, others did, is essentially the invention of motion pictures. Again, an example of the flying gallop. Mybridge continues to influence today. I'm going to show you a video here. You can read the title, A Dream of Pastures. This is an installation. There's music that goes along with it, and rather than talk over the music, I just want to set this up. But essentially, it's a sequence of frames of pictures, not unlike the horse running that you saw of Mybridge. And essentially how motion pictures work, if you have a sequence of still images that are flashed one after another very quickly and how films work is there's 24 frames or 24 still images per second that run past the screen as we're looking at an image. And so since they're so quick, our persistence of vision, we don't see that there's a flicker of light generally in between. You're going to see that in that this installation. What they do is they have a large piece, looks like it's probably metal, where they've got a series of images of a horse. They're going to have a person from the audience, uh, from the installation, who will come and sit on a bike. The bike, through a series of chains and gears, will run these images. They'll flicker back and forth between the, the light, and you're going to see a projected moving image of these series of still images. In addition, they have a spotlight on the rider of the horse when this is installed outside. So the spotlight actually creates a shadow of the rider. So you're going to see a projected image of the horse on a wall and then the shadow of the rider of the bike and it looks like he's or she is riding the horse. Anyway, on to the video. Anyway, pretty cool, huh? I wanted to show you some other ways that sequence is used. In this case, maybe some of you are familiar with this or have even seen Cadillac Ranch. Cadillac Ranch exists on some land that Stanley Marsh, who recently passed away, who was one of Texas' most wealthy residents, 
has set up a number of art projects on his land. Ant Farm, who is a group of Bay Area artists, uh, Chip Lord uh, primarily, came up with the idea. Stanley helped fund it, and they put this along Interstate 40 outside of Amarillo on Stanley's land called Toad Hall. Anyway, uh, these were 10 descending years of Cadillacs buried half in the ground. Over the years, or frankly over the decades, they've been graffitied up and then repainted and then more graffiti, etc. So in a way, it's a living art piece. It keeps changing. But the idea of sequence, a year, each image, each Cadillac representing a specific year in a specific order. Rube Goldberg is a cartoonist, or was a cartoonist, who was quite popular in the 1930s and 1940s in America. He's not somebody we hear a lot about today. I'm in my mid-60s. When I was growing up in the 1950s, I remember seeing what were probably a few re-syndicated Rube Goldberg cartoons in the Sunday funny papers. Goldberg was known for this kind of cause and effect. And you see it in the cartoons that usually come with some sort of narrative inscription here that kind of uh, show that there's these fanciful machines that he's invented with his pen, if you will, that create a series of chain reactions, that one thing happens that causes something else to happen. So, for example, here's his solution to oversleeping. And let's just let me point out, here's A, and so you go A, B, C, wherever D is. Um, anyway, D, E, F, G. So anyway, when the sum comes up, the magnifying glass A burns a hole in the paper bag, dropping water into the ladle C and lifting the gate D, which allows a heavy ball E to roll down the chute. F, the rope G, lifts the bed H into vertical position and drops you into your shoes I. P.S. You can't go back and sneak a few winks because there's no place to lie down because, again, the bed has moved. So these were these fanciful inventions, if you will. Indeed, the term Goldbergian refers to exactly that. So if you've ever heard that, and I'm finding more and more students today have never heard that term, it's something that I used to hear growing up. But frankly, I was watching our attorney general testify in front of Congress the other day, and after he was asked a question, his response was, well, that's kind of Goldbergian. And it means one thing happens that causes something else to happen that caused something else, etc., let me just read you the inscription or the, the phrase that goes along with this. And so again, you would start at A to B to C and follow the letters. As you raise your spoon of soup A to your mouth, it pulls strings B, therefore jerking ladle C, which throws cracker D past parrot E. Parrot jumps after cracker and perch F tilts Upsetting seeds, G, into pale, H, extra weight and pale pulls cord, I, which opens and lights automatic cigar lighter, J, setting off skyrocket, K, which causes sickle, L, to cut the string, M, and allow pendum, pendulum, which attached napkin to swing back and forth, thereby wiping off your chin. After the meal, substitute a harmonica for the napkin, and you'll be able to entertain your guest with a little music. So their humor, their cartoons, but also the idea of sequence. One thing starts, then another, then another, then another. A specific order, and order's important. If you jumbled up the order, this doesn't make sense. The invention does not work. Well, comic books, for example, and Goldberg gave me the idea to follow that up here, it's one example of a typical narrative approach to sequence. I'm still mad at my mom from 50 years ago when she found a bunch of my Zap comic books that I'd started collecting when they first came out in the late 60s and early 70s. 
Uh, I left for college and she went through my closet and found a bunch of these comic books, which I knew would be valuable. She thought they were pornographic, so she threw them all out. And indeed, they might be slightly pornographic in a cartoon form. Here's one of the pages from that. What I like about this in terms of illustrating sequence, though, here's a typical narrative left to right, you know, where it's telling a story and the story is in that linear sequential form. But then towards the bottom here, the artist simply uses that grid format but overlaps some of the imagery. Uh, and what you see is it's kind of, in a way, almost two approaches to sequence. If you're a comic book fan, the project that goes along with this talk will be an ideal time to try out making a first comic book page. Well, another approach to sequence is artist Bruce Nauman. He's doing that with light and neon. This piece, Bruce, for Bruce Nauman, was part of an exhibition at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art called Artist as Ego. And you can see he's spelling out his name in multiple letters, B B B B B R R R R R U U U, spelling out Bruce. This is photographed in such a way that you don't clearly get the sequence. I'm going to have to define it a little bit. But these are neon pieces, and essentially, this one lights up and all the others are dark. Then that one, then that one, then that one, then that one. So basically on the wall, it would go life, death, love, hate, pleasure, pain, and repeat the cycles of life in a way. Same thing here except human desire, hope, dreams, need, human desire, and back and forth. And it circles around and, in essence, is a circular sequence. Dwayne Michaels is a photographer. Perhaps some of the best examples of sequence, at least in terms of a narrative sequence. His sequences are somewhat like films, condensed, if you will. In these sequences, the first picture will relate to the second, and the second to the third, and the third to the fourth. But that, without the second picture, the first and third might not directly relate. I think you're going to see as we go through the nine pictures in this sequence, it's called Things Are Queer, that each picture reveals something else. And so it changes our mind in a way and changes our approach. So I'm going to start here, and I'm going to shut up for a minute, and I'm going to take a few seconds and go through every picture in this sequence. Things are queer. So he leads us right back to where we began. And he takes us in a short little adventure. Each one we realize is an illusion. Each picture changes our mind in a way about the previous picture and what we were looking at. It's a circular sequence, meaning it ends where it begins. But let's look at a couple others of his sequences. This one's called Chance Meeting, and I'll do this one fairly quickly. Or one of my favorite of Michael's sequences is Grandpa Goes to Heaven. You can see the little boy and read by the title that his grandpa's lying there in the bed, has probably just passed away. Oh, and he's a spirit. He's got wings. He's an angel. 
So long. Goodbye. His pictures are narratives. They're sequential to tell a story, to create that narrative. One picture can't say it all in many of these stories, so he relies on building that story through a group of pictures. Well, another approach to this is diptychs and triptychs. A diptych is two of a kind. These are typical in early Christian art. You can see Christ and Virgin Mary. Diptych, essentially meaning two-panel. Triptych, meaning three-panel. And certainly they had religious overtones in the beginning, but there's a lot of contemporary artists. Tom Huck's one who will sometimes use diptych and triptych formats. If you look carefully or at this reproduction, or if you look up his work, you'll find that the content is really quite different than the early religious use of diptychs and triptychs. Well, serial imagery. The sequence is a series. It's a group of related parts, but a sequence has a specific order, start, middle, and an end. And a sequence or sequential imagery really needs to be seen in that order to be fully understood where serial imagery can be seen in any order. You can jumble them up, put them in one order one day, another order the next day. You can put them in a grid. You can lay them out in different arrangements, and it just doesn't matter. It's not the arrangement per se, but it's the resonance, the connections between images that help provide meaning. Serial imagery goes back more than a century, where you can see some of the early serial imagery were done by the painter, the Impressionist Claude Monet. In the 1890s, he did a series of paintings of haystacks. And what you see in his haystack paintings is the subject matter is similar from one painting to the next, fields with stacks of hay. The compositions are somewhat similar as well. What changes is light and color. And what you begin to realize is that's what they're really about. The haystack is the vehicle for him to explore different color combinations and depictions of light. He took that idea, perhaps even to more extreme, in a series of paintings that he did in 1892 and 1893 of the Rouen Cathedral in France. Here's one of those paintings. There's another, and here you can see that what's radical, if I can go back and forth, it's not the change in composition. They're actually pretty similar, as is the next. But it's the color and the quality of light that really radically changes. And when you see a whole series of those together, you do see there are subtle changes in composition but more radical changes in light and color. And again, that partly tells us that's his interest here. That's what he's really exploring, are color combinations and the qualities of light. You could put these in any order whatsoever, and they make the exact same sense. Perhaps the most famous example of serial imagery is Andy Warhol's soup cans. Warhol was a pop artist, Pop art draws its subject matter from popular culture. So he painted a whole series of Campbell soup cans. And as you saw in that first image, you could put them in any order. It really doesn't matter. It's the sense of repetition. The fact that he's using a subject matter that at the time was unusual in art, just common everyday household materials. They also speak to consumerism and those kinds of things. But their strength comes from that sense of repetition, almost monotony, suggesting there's a lot of these things out there. But serial imagery has been used for a long time. It was prevalent in Germany in the 20th century. Karl Blossfeld was an early 20th century German photographer. He actually turned to photography to make images of plants that he hoped to make sculptures from. 
So he used the camera to record these botanical specimens. But what you're going to see is he photographed them from a similar vantage point, a similar distance. He's generally using a blank tone or color in the background. So essentially what's changing is not the form from picture to picture, or at least his approach to form. It's certainly changing the subject matter. And so essentially what he's doing, he's creating a catalog of these forms. This sense of cataloging visual artifacts is one of the tenets of serial imagery. And one last image here. But again, the idea is you look at pictures together, a series or body of work. You should think about whether the order they appear in is important. If it is, take control of that narrative. Put them in an order. Specify that when they're displayed. If that's not important, so be it. But this is the two primary methods that groups of images work together, sequentially or serially.